So by now, you're able to take any argument that you're presented with, come up with an accurate diagram of the, uh, that argument, an accurate representation of its structure, of how the claims that make up that argument are related to each other logically, and you're able to evaluate each and every premise in that argument on the basis of acceptability. Now we're ready to move on to our second criterion, our second way in which we evaluate arguments, and that is relevance. And relevance is going to function in a significantly different way than acceptability. Perhaps most crucially, you cannot evaluate premises for, for relevance well unless your diagram is accurate. If your diagram has significant mistakes, your ability to evaluate the premises for relevance will be significantly lessened. I'll explain more about that in a minute. Relevance is all centered around one general idea, and it's different than the mere content of the premise, which is what acceptability was really about. When we ask about the relevance of a premise, we're asking, does it matter to the conclusion that it's supposedly giving evidence for? Does it relate to it? Does it bear upon it? Now, the diagram tells us very clearly that the arguer thinks that the premise is relevant. The question now is, do we agree with the arguer? Now, Let's look at how the accuracy of the diagram affects our ability to evaluate premises for relevance. Let's say you have a diagram that looks like this. So it's an argument with multiple levels of sub-arguments. There's some dependent premises, mostly independent premises. The question of relevance is, does the premise matter to the claim that it's supposedly giving evidence for. Now you remember with acceptability, we really could take the premise out of the context of the argument. The accuracy of the diagram really didn't matter because it's just a question of, is this claim acceptable? Is this claim acceptable? But when we're dealing with relevance, we have to know what the claim is supposed to be doing. We have to be clear on the specific job. So relevance would be asking, is two relevant to one? Is three relevant to one? Because it's three's job to provide evidence for one, and it's two's job to provide evidence for one. But the relevance of seven is related not to one, but to two. In many ways, when we're dealing with relevance, we're really questioning the relationship among the premises, not so much the premises in isolation. And keep in mind that the relevance of any given premise relies heavily on who's evaluating the argument. So if I'm trying to convince you to buy a certain car, and I said, look, you should buy this car. It's got great legroom, and it works fabulously in the snow. Okay? Those, are, are, those are claims. It has great legroom, and it works fabulously in the snow. That might be acceptable. Let's say that they're true. But are they relevant? Well, they're not relevant to you if you're moving to Florida. They're not relevant to you if you're on the short side. So claims that may be acceptable to virtually anyone can differ in terms of their relevance depending on who's listening. Another thing about relevance. When you're dealing with independent premises, relevance is fairly straightforward. Is eight relevant to seven? Again, we know the author thinks so. Do you agree? But with dependent premises, they have no relevance by themselves. They need each other to be relevant at all. So when it comes to evaluating dependent premises for relevance, you have to ask together, do four and five provide relevant evidence for three? So those are two ways in which your diagram will dictate what specific questions you ask about relevance. Very different from acceptability. Okay. Let's move on to some ways in which premises can either succeed or fail on the basis of relevance. Okay, one way, let's go through uh, several ways in which premises can succeed with regard to relevance. One way that premises can succeed is if they provide specific examples that give evidence for a more general claim. So I might want to argue, look, there are no, ba no good bagels in the entire state of North Carolina. That's a very general claim. And what, are, what premises could I give to give support to that general claim? There are no good bagels in Burlington, North Carolina. There are no good bagels in Greensboro, North Carolina. There are no good bagels 
in Charlotte, North Carolina. Each of these individual premises may be specific claims that are sufficiently and appropriately linked to a general claim such that they're relevant. One main reason that those claims are relevant to the general claim is that all of the cities I'm talking about are in fact in North Carolina. Another way in which premises can be relevant is in fact the opposite. If premises involve one or more general claims that then could be applied to a specific situation mentioned in the conclusion, then that those general claims can also be considered relevant. Look, you should never steal. That could be a general claim. You should not steal objects that aren't yours. Downloading music for free off the internet is a form of stealing. Therefore, you should not download music free off the internet. General claims about not stealing, okay, to, that lead to a more specific claim because they are appropriately related to that specific claim, that you specifically should not take, download music from the internet. So both of those can work. Now, in order for them to be acceptable, one has to make sure that the specific and the general, the general specific here, are aligned correctly. Okay. So if I want to say, well, the general claim is that uh, all Tom Cruise movies are artistic abominations, and then I mention a movie like Crazy Heart and say, see, that one was an artistic abomination. Therefore, all Tom Cruise's movies are artistic abominations. The problem here is that the specific doesn't match the general. Tom Cruise was not in Crazy Heart, so it doesn't actually apply. So one has to make sure that those two are aligned in a way that makes sense. Okay, another way in which premises can be um, deemed relevant is that premises together can enumerate a number of options Reject many, leaving one. So a parent might say to a child, look, you're out of school for the summer, you've got three options. You either go get a job, you go back to that camp that you really dislike, or you work for me around the house. You don't want to go back to that camp, you'd hate working for me, you're going to get a job. In that case, the premises, many, many of which would be dependent, if you notice, would be one claim saying there are three options and then a series of claims that disqualify all but perhaps one of the options. So you've got three options. Option one won't work. Option two won't work. Conclusion is you've got to go with option three. Now because all of those premises are dependent, notice that if any one of them isn't true, the whole argument falls apart. So if that en enterprising young child could say, but I know there's a fourth option. I could go travel the world with my fun Uncle Joshy. That's an option you didn't mention then the argument actually falls apart. So enumerating a number of options, rejecting many, and leaving one that constitutes the conclusion is a way for premises to be relevant. Finally, premises can be relevant if they speak to a part, a significant and relevant part of the conclusion. So if I am trying to convince someone that they should start saving for retirement as early as their late 20s, I might have one uh, premise that speaks to one important part of that conclusion. Uh, namely, you won't be dependent on your children in your old age. That only speaks to one reason that one should put money aside for retirement. There may be many, many others. You get a better return on your investment. You maximize your employees' contributions. But the fact that it speaks to one part of the conclusion is enough to make it relevant. Now keep in mind, we're only gone through two out of the three criteria that we're going to use to evaluate arguments as a whole. So it's possible that a premise might be acceptable but fail on relevance. It might be possible that a premise is not acceptable but succeed on relevance. It would still be deemed unacceptable in general in terms of uh, critiquing the argument. And it's possible that the premise would pass the tests of both acceptability and relevance but run into problems with our third criterion that we'll get to shortly, which is sufficiency of grounds. Now, as you're starting to practice the relevance criterion, it's important that your first practices sort of get a little bit away from acceptability. Only evaluate the premises for relevance. Once you've got some experience with that, then, and you'll need to do this for the quiz, 
go back and evaluate premises for both acceptability and relevance. You'll need to do them both so that you can really experience and gain mastery in the different ways in which these two criteria function. Again, not only in that they're asking different questions, but that they ask different things in terms of the accuracy of the diagram, and that you're going to group the premises differently for relevance that you do with acceptability. Let me end the uh, lesson on relevance with, with one cautionary note. One of the most difficult things about applying the criterion of relevance is when the logic between the premise and the conclusion is so tight, it seems so obvious, that it's hard to explain why the premise is relevant. So say, um, for example, if one is saying you should make chocolate cake for Susie's birthday because chocolate is her favorite. Susie's favorite cake is chocolate, therefore you should make it for her birthday. Is that premise relevant to the conclusion? The obvious answer seems to be yes, but then how do you explain it? In this case, you could have it explain it by use of a principle, perhaps saying that one should have one's favorite cake for birthday. In other cases, you may need to really be explicit about the job that each claim is doing. So the first claim uh, articulates a preference of the person to be celebrated, and the conclusion is about that celebration itself. Therefore, because the person being celebrated should have their wishes met, the premise is relevant to the conclusion. Don't worry too much about the awkwardness of your writing, of your explanation when it comes to relevance. Sometimes to do it accurately, you end up with quite awkward language. Try to be as specific as possible. And when you're having a hard time articulating why you're deeming a premise relevant or irrelevant, imagine someone disagreeing with you. If you say, no, this premise really does matter. Imagine someone saying, it doesn't matter at all. You're not arguing about whether it's true or not. You're arguing about does it matter and try to convince that person that your judgment is right. So again, when you turn to exercises for relevance, just focus on relevance alone. Once you've got some experience, that under your belt, then move on to evaluating arguments on the basis of both acceptability and relevance.